My name is Sean Kent Hayashi. Welcome. So why do people bully others? According to Dr. Gary Namey, social psychologist and leading expert on workplace bullying, the reason that people bully others is because they perceive others to be a threat. If they perceive that someone is smarter, brighter, mm, prettier, kinder, nicer, any of those things, this can trigger a would-be bully into action. So what's the dominant emotion for a bully? That's right, it's unprocessed anger and fear. That's what triggers bully-like behavior. So you decided to attend this session today, and I thank you so much for doing so, but you decided to attend this session because you want a current toolkit for dealing with bullying in the workplace, right? And what that means is that you really want authentic collaboration. You want teams to come together and work well together and enjoy what they're doing and be engaged in their workplace. And today I'm going to share with you how to create that, how to bully-proof your culture and help people to resolve conflicts better, deal productively with uncomfortable emotions, and here is the first tool in our effort to begin to bully-proof your culture. Imagination. The first step in creating anything you want is to begin to imagine what it looks like, what it feels like. So Albert Einstein said, imagination is a preview of life's coming attractions. And I love that quote because it reminds me of the importance of really thinking about and allowing ourselves to picture what is it that I would like to create. So the solution is creating a great team. The solution is putting the stake in the ground organizationally that you want high-performing teams. So let's think about the qualities of an ideal team for a minute. I'd like you to think for yourself about a team that you've been on in the past, one where people were thriving, there was no bullying going on, people sincerely enjoyed working there. I want you to think about a quality or two and turn and introduce yourself to somebody you have not met yet and share one quality, a trait about a team that you were on that was high performing where there wasn't any bullying going on. So I'll give you a moment to do that. Let's see if the traits you identified match those that I've identified. So as I share some of these traits of high performing teams, I want you to cheer out if that was something that you said. So great teams are unified in their core beliefs and committed to a common purpose. Great teams recognize that complementary skills and experiences exceed those of any one individual. They value each other for the diverse skills and perspectives that they bring to the organization. And they have fun together, right? Woo! -hoo! We all enjoy having fun. They also trust one another. They're confident in each other's ability to do the job, right? They know how to handle conflict productively. Notice no one mentioned that one. Yeah, that's so important. Oh, somebody says we didn't have conflict. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. Okay, they help each other acquire new skills for achieving performance goals and growth. All right, very good. And they're made up of individuals who are emotionally literate. Woohoo! Okay, good. Because this trait is so important in the equation of creating a bully proof culture, we're going to dive somewhat deeply into it today. What does it mean to be emotionally literate. 
Well, when I first heard the phrase emotionally illiterate, it hit me like a lightning bolt. Let me tell you what was going on for me in my organization at the time. I worked for a division of the Dun & Bradstreet Corporation, and I was responsible for leadership development. And I was uh, informed that we were going to be having some significant changes coming up, and I was asked to hire a PhD in change management who could come and help us navigate through change. Can, can you relate to this at all? Not at me if you know what I'm talking about, right? So the leadership team is pulled together. I interview seven PhDs in change management. I find the one that's going to fit with our culture perfectly. In he comes. He meets one-on-one -on -one with each of our senior leaders. And afterwards, imagine this, we're seated at my round table in my office and he says to me, you know, Sean, before we talk about change management, there's something far more important we need to address. This is a group of emotionally illiterate leaders. <laughs> there it was, lightning bulb moment for me, because if they were emotionally illiterate and I was responsible for leadership development, what did that mean about me? <laughs> I said, I'm going to take this on. So I began to really dive into the topic of emotional intelligence and how to build it in an individual as well as in a team and a culture. So being emotionally literate means that we can identify what we're feeling in the moment and we can make intentional choices about how to respond. But it also means that we can read the emotions of other people and we can respond in ways that engage them productively. Emotional intelligence can be measured. It can be measured with assessments. And people with high emotional intelligence exhibit these following tendencies here. Uh, they complete tasks faster. They're more resilient. They experience less stress in their lives overall. They feel better about the quality of their life. They adapt better, become star performers. They're willing to influence others in positive, productive, engaging ways. They have fewer career derailers. And oh, by the way, the research is quite clear. Over time, they also tend to earn more. Who doesn't want that, right? We all want that, yeah? So people who are emotionally intelligent understand how best to use their emotions to perform at the top of this ladder. They know what research has mm, confirmed. Intuitively, they understand that the best creative thinking, the best problem solving, hey, even the best golf swing, all of it happens when we're at the top of the emotions ladder. So those emotions at the top here, love, joy, hope. Now there are loads of other words that we can use to describe those top emotions. What are some words that you use? Peaceful, feeling gra grateful, gratitude, excited, passionate, walking on sunshine, happy to be here, right? So individuals or teams that are stuck in the bottom range of the emotions ladder, oh, sadness, anger, fear, have an uphill battle in producing results. And if we have bullies in our organization, we know they're not just driving down morale, they're driving down engagement, productivity, peace, harmony, all those things we like at the top of the ladder. But they're also likely increasing people checking out on the job and causing turnover. You see, it's costly to have a bully on board. Several of you are nodding at me right now. It is very costly to have a bully on board. And I know this from personal experience. I wrote about this in an article for Forbes at one point in my career, I reported to a CEO who created intense competition in his organization. If any of you, you can nod very slightly just to say, oh yeah, we can relate to that, right? Um, he created such intense competition that at one point he asked me to hire two people 
for a C-level role in the organization to do the exact same job and not tell each other about the other. And he wanted me to bring them on board, get them oriented, determine which one was better, and then fire the other. Did I say no? Absolutely. I said no. I fought that fight, but he was adamant. Um, when you think about these kinds of tactics, do they work? We all know the answer. No, these tactics don't work, hardly. Instead, it creates a culture typical when there is unresolved anger and fear. Backstabbing, infighting, resource hoarding. No one on that leadership team trusted each other. And I watched talented people walk out the door. And then I did too. My moment came after... My boss wanted me to shut down a group of women who were complaining about some egregious behavior on the part of an executive at one of those events where there was uh, too much beer and alcohol flowing. Can you relate to what I'm saying there? My boss wanted me to shut this down because the person that was being complained about was a very high producer. Oh. Talk about the, the gut, right? The intuition saying, this is really, really wrong. I told my boss so, and then I said, I'm not going to work here anymore. I can't work for somebody like that, right? We have to put a stake in the ground and say, this is not acceptable. So leaving to create something better. I realized, I had that light bulb moment for myself that said, wait a minute, what I'm really passionate about is creating organizations, creating the training, the coaching, the tools, so that people don't grow up thinking, don't grow up professionally, thinking this behavior is okay. Right? What if we were able to work with this guy earlier in his career and, and teach him how to manage and lead collaboratively instead of autocratically before he had caused so much anguish in the workplace needlessly putting his own organization at risk. So today I want to share with you five very specific tools to help you create a culture where you have high-performing teams and a bully-proof environment. These tools work. So first, establish norms for dealing with conflict. Clearly define the behavior that is desired and that which is not welcomed here. I help organizations create, uh, imagine this. So we'll pull together uh, perhaps 20 people. Now, sometimes I work with organizations that are 20 people. That's the whole organization. Other times I work with organizations that have thousands of people in them. But we typically do this in small groups. And we ask people, how do you like to resolve conflict? When conflict is resolved well, what happens? What does it look like? And we get people talking about that. And we get them to list out the behaviors, the actions, the ways in which they would prefer. And then we call that down into a norms for dealing with conflict for our organization. We also uh, get people talking about what are the behaviors that we don't want to see? What's not here? And so now we've got the two lists, and we can start to share those in orientation, in team meetings. We can even hang them on the walls and help people to have the language and the norms for understanding how to deal with conflict. We also want to facilitate great communication skills and use meetings to solve problems together. Create an our issues list. This is one where everybody can put up on uh, a public forum, kind of, this is what we're challenged with. These are what the uh, things that are facing us, hurdles. I work with a, a steel company, and not everybody in that organization has access to a computer, for example. So what we've done is we've created a big board, and people can use 3 by 5 cards or Post-it notes to pop their issues up there. And now, if we make it okay to talk about what the issues are, and then we say we have a weekly team meeting to, in essence, stand in front of that board or stand around the list and talk about how do we solve this together. 
by creating these tools for people to communicate, uh, it makes a big difference. So the reality is we don't want to eliminate conflict. Anybody want to guess why we don't want to eliminate conflict? It's creative. You see, what happens is when you think about the best new products, services, opportunities, where did they typically from, come from? Somebody complaining about something that wasn't as good as it could be. And so we want to embrace that. We want to make it OK to talk about how could we make this even better? What would it look like? What would it sound like? What might it taste like if we took it to that next level? So making this a part of the communication process in your organization. And I'm a big believer in creating weekly solutions meetings where you're talking about this list. And you might even say, what are some of the challenges you've heard from customers this past week? What would it look like for us to innovate, collaborate, solve those? So create a culture of collaboration. Research indicates that competitive environments are a breeding ground for bullying. Competitive environments tend to crop up in industries where there are major disruptions going on, bleak prospects, and no job security. When I coach leaders and teams, our focus is always on creating a culture of collaboration, not competition. Next, fourth, play to people's strengths. In our high-performing team retreats, we show people how to play to each other's strengths and cover their blind spots. What's some strengths? What are strengths that you like to see in people? Communication skills, emotional intelligence, self-awareness, Teamwork, yeah, these are all great strengths. And so when we have a very clear understanding of what the core strengths are from each of the people on our team, then we can also begin to talk about what are our blind spots. Because, oh, by the way, all of us have things about the way we interact and engage that we don't see in ourselves, but that have a ripple effect or an impact on others, right? Chances are you know exactly what some of the blind spots are of some of the people on your team. When we do a high-performing team retreat, we make sure people understand both of those. And when I say cover your blind spots, by the way, I don't mean ignore them or pretend they're not there. What I mean is making sure that we have somebody on the team who's really good at that. So for example, uh, I'm dyslexic. And uh, proofreading is not something I do particularly well. But I've got somebody on my team, Kate, who is a marvelous proofreader. And she knows that her job exists to cover my blind spots. Is this making sense? And when you set up a culture where people really understand that we all have strengths, we all have blind spots, and part of what makes a high-performing team is us really understanding that about each other. When we do a high-performing team retreat, we create a team communication playbook so that people can see not only their own strengths, but each other's strengths. And then we create the opportunity to talk about how to cover these, the blind spots. And again, you can facilitate this kind of conversation in your organization. And then fifth, cultivate emotional intelligence. Train everyone in this skill. And again, because this is so important, we're going to dive a little deeper. The good news is, researchers have proven our brains are much more plastic than we originally realized. What does this mean? Emotional intelligence is not a fixed trait. It can be developed. It can be dramatically increased. No matter what your age, occupation, anyone can raise their emotional intelligence. It just requires that we really understand what is emotional intelligence. And I like to simplify it. Rather than getting it too complex or too much in the science, I like to say, let's just cut to the chase. What is emotional intelligence? You remember I shared with you that I decided to dive into this uh, topic many years ago. And at that time, I said, I'm going to create an emotions dictionary. Because if emotionally illiterate is a problem, 
being able to read emotions will solve the problem, right? Uh, I began to collect all the words in the English language that have an emotions connotation to them. Anybody want to guess how many words that is? I'm hearing somebody say thousands. Yep. I hear millions. Anybody want to say all of them? <laughs> so, you know, I had about a thousand words in my emotions dictionary when I went to talk to a PhD in emotional intelligence from my alma mater, the University of Pennsylvania. And I asked him uh, what he thought of my emotions dictionary, and he laughed at me. He said, uh-uh, Sean, there are seven core emotions. These are chemically identifiable in our bodies. These are the seven chemically identifiable emotional states, and we are always marinating in one of them. So somebody else taught me, by the way, that there's a vibrational level associated with each of these emotions. So then I was able to put it into a ladder or a hierarchy, starting with the highest vibration. Love, joy, hope, sadness, envy, anger, fear. If you think about the last time that you felt really great, just walking on sunshine, passionate, happy, hold your body like that right now. Wow, everybody just sat up. Energy just went up, right? We're, we're lighter. The vibration level lightens when we move up this scale. I encourage you to memorize these words and what is truth is that you may use other words to describe each of these vibration levels for you. We mentioned before, like love, joy, hope, there are a bunch of words you could use. And of those thousand words, a bunch of them are going to map back to this, right? Uh, what's a word that people might use for sadness? Blue. Grief. Somebody might say, I'm okay. I'm okay, don't, don't bother me. But you can tell that just the energy of the way they're coming across is that they're sad, right? Now, if we don't deal with our sadness, what does it become? So I hear some people saying anger, and I heard somebody else say depressed, right? So if we stay at that vibration level and we don't deal with our sadness, it becomes depression. But if we don't deal with it and we talk about that, it can also become anger. So sadness is an emotion, by the way, that is very healthy when we experience loss. Sadness can be a huge gift to help us to understand what it is that we value, what's important to us in our lives. But we need to learn the lesson from the sadness and move forward, not get stuck in the loss. Um, anger. What are some words we might use to describe anger? Annoyed. Frustrated. Bitter. Resentful. Perturbed. Yes, all of these are great words. Again, these all map back to this chemical marinade. Anger is a wonderful emotion. This comes as a shock sometimes to some of my coaching clients who are coming to me because they're really struggling to deal with their anger. Anger is a signal that something has crossed our boundaries. And if we can listen to ourselves and check in and ask the right questions, what crossed my boundaries? What is it that I need? What do I need to ask for? Who do I need to ask for that? How do I craft a conversation that doesn't necessarily come out of anger? One of the big ahas for one of my coaching clients, he was a vice president of technology in a major pharmaceutical company, and I still remember like this the day he said to me, you mean when I feel angry, I don't have to let other people know that? Uh, yeah, that would be right. We don't necessarily have to let other people know that we're feeling angry. What we have to do is process ourselves through our anger. Now, there is an emotion here that we really do need to talk about. Because the bullying workplace is filled with fear. 
Unprocessed fear is the dominant emotion for somebody who's behaving like a bully. And fear and anger that aren't dealt with, oftentimes the person who's marinating in fear or anger does not realize that they are showing up to others like a bully. Verbal abuse, negative gossip, rumors, passive-aggressive sarcasm, these are forms of fear-based bullying. And very often, the person who's doing it isn't aware of the impact that they're having on others. So recognizing when fear is causing or driving our behavior is very important. Let's imagine that we can teach a budding bully to recognize that fear is what is causing or driving their behavior and show them that they can make better choices about how they respond, how they act, what they do. We can teach them how to process themselves through their fear so they overcome obstacles. We can help a budding bully imagine new solutions and we can help them learn how to facilitate conversations for conflict resolution and new skill development. Now the other side of the coin that we really have to look at is why don't people speak up? Why don't people um, let us know when they're experiencing discomfort? Why don't they share their creative new ideas or their breakthrough innovations? Why do they allow other people's resistance to shut them down? It's because they're afraid. They might be afraid of being labeled a troublemaker, not believed, or that they might be forced out of the organization by someone more powerful. So fear is what happens when people don't trust the culture, the leaders, or their fellow team members. This is why raising the emotional intelligence of all team members and organizations is so vital. It's a part of our work that helps to create great places to work. And to begin to recognize when the voice in our head is saying, I don't know if I can handle this, we're triggering fear in ourselves. And when we're triggering fear or anger in ourselves, how might we be perceived by others without even knowing it? As a bully. In cultures lacking communication skills and emotional intelligence, conflict escalates, fear spreads, creating paralysis and dysfunction across the organization. And then someone complains to HR about egregious behavior things that are going wrong. But maybe the aggressor is a valuable money maker or a member of the leadership team. Solving the problem isn't easy because no one wants to put their head in the lion's mouth. And once we're swirling in fear, oh my goodness, it makes it so hard to think clearly. Have you ever been in that swirling in fear place? Nod at me if you can relate where you just can't think your way through it. I see a lot of nodding going on. This is a universal experience that we all have. And this is one of those times when people call me. If someone needs to tell a high-performing leader that he's a part or she's a part of the problem, they often want an outsider to do it. And, and part of what I want you to know is this can be a part of your toolkit, right? To help a bully understand the impact of their behavior, you can use, or I can use, tools like 360 feedback and perceptual interviews. Now, when I do 360 feedback in perceptual interviews, what I'm doing is I'm talking to uh, the key stakeholders that the person identifies themselves. Who are the key stakeholders to your success? Have them make a list. And then we set it up that I can talk to those folks in a 10-minute, 15-minute conversation. And I ask questions like, what is Sally doing really well? How does she add value to the team? 
And what's Sally doing that's getting in the way? What would you like more of? What would you like less of? I create a report like that, and then I'm able to debrief that with this person, typically a leader who's uh, causing problems, to help them understand the impact of their behavior. Assessments, coaching, all of these things can help convey the message so that it can be heard. I'm not the only one who sees intentionally creating a strong work culture as a solution for bullying. Johnny C. Taylor, the president and CEO of SHRM, told a group of California legislators in January of 2018, culture always trumps compliance. Relying solely on rules and education to address harassment does not work. Here's what works. A strong, healthy culture establishes norms for interacting that continually exude a message of, eh, you know what, we don't do that here. Peers who are willing to say, eh, not here. You can do that somewhere else, but, but not here. Here's how we work. I, I want you to be really successful here, and as a result, I just wanted to help you out so you knew that. So in emotional intelligence, I mentioned that there are seven core emotions and there's five skills. And when we are highly emotionally intelligent, when we're the kind of people who can say, eh, not here, we've got these five skills. So the first one is self-awareness. And self-awareness is knowing what you are feeling in the moment. It's knowing what triggers you to feel emotions. It's knowing your own behavioral tendencies and recognizing that there can be a gap between how we see ourselves and how others see us. This is often a big aha for people. A bunch of you are nodding at me again. How we experience ourselves, how other people see us may be quite different. Self-regulation is the ability to make choices about how to use emotions. I love this picture of self-regulation. This does not happen by accident, right? What did it take to be able to get a picture like this? <laughs> I heard somebody say Photoshop, but this is actually a real picture here, and uh, it took a tremendous amount of training, right, to get these dogs to understand a sit and a stay and to do so even despite an interesting distraction, yes, right? This group of dogs has a higher level of self-regulation ability than a lot of executive teams that I have worked with. So after, <laughs> I hear somebody saying, I'm putting that picture up in my office. After a disagreement with a teenager and then battling traffic and arriving late to an important meeting, you may be marinating in the stress hormone cortisol that causes fear or anger, depending on how you're talking about it in your head. And without self-awareness, without self-regulation skills, when we're triggered, we are liable to bite someone's head off with a snarky comment and not even be aware that we've done it. With self-regulation, self-awareness, we can instead take a couple of really deep breaths. Take some deep breaths right now with me. Deep breaths tell your brain that you do not have to go into fight or flight. We can refrain then from saying things that a colleague mm, might experience as damaging the relationship. Now the next competency is motivation. And motivation involves understanding what your natural passions are. What gets you out of bed in the morning and drives you to be your best it's also about recognizing what motivates other people. I mentioned that high-performing team retreat experience where we talk about people's strengths. And when we're really playing to our own strengths, when we know what to say, yeah, that, that fits me, that is totally me, when we know that, we are going to be more highly motivated, right? And when we understand that about the other folks that we work with, we can then invite them into projects, assignments, goals, and use the language of their motivators. Now, people who have empathy, they're the folks who can imagine and check out what other people might be feeling in the moment. For example, 
I might notice that Sally seems frustrated or annoyed. Something's clearly bothering her. And if I have high observation skills, I could say something like, Sally, I sense maybe you're frustrated or angry. Would, would you like to talk that out? I can be a sounding board to that. And now Sally can decide if she wants to talk to me about it or if she wants to talk to somebody else about it. But at least it's cued her from an empathetic standpoint that I'm willing. It's giving her that opportunity to unpack and deal with her feelings. This is an example of positive empathy, but it's not getting in the sandbox with her and keeping her stuck there. See, when we allow people to vent, have you ever noticed that it just reinforces for people, right? That's not what empathy is. Empathy is having the right questions to ask people to help them get unstuck when they're in fear, anger, sadness. So if you have developed self-awareness, self-regulation, empathy, and motivation, there's a really good chance that you probably also have very good social skills. People with superior social skills manage relationships effectively. They're more than just friendly. They're more than just a smile and, and a, an appreciation. They can authentically persuade, build rapport, manage conflicts, and develop strategic alliances. They can set goals. They can bring a group of people together and keep them moving towards those goals. They don't let people's resistance and fear stop them from moving forward. So now let's dive a little deeper into how do we raise the emotional intelligence of organizations? How do you go from knowing what it is to actually cultivating it in your culture? Well, here we go. First, make a public statement. And typically from the top down, but it can come from sideways up, whatever. Uh, that we are going to create a culture of high-performing teams. We're going to be a great place to work. We're putting the stake in the ground. We're publicly declaring this, and we're going to build the tools and the systems to make that happen. Employers control the work environment, so they're ultimately responsible for making sure that people aren't harassed or abused on their watch. Again, this requires that stake in the ground for high-performing culture. Another tool for your toolkit in building this kind of organization are workshops and learning experiences that create a common language so that people have cultural norms that they can speak to each other about. I happen to lead several workshops on emotional intelligence, and in fact, I've got one coming up in September, September 12th, uh, in the Bethlehem, Pennsylvania area. But there are lots of different uh, resources and tools for getting people to use the same framework, the same model for emotional intelligence. And in fact, you can become certified in emotional intelligence skills as a facilitator and coach for these uh, kinds of tools. This book provides the specific guidance to increase your emotional intelligence, and it provides the questions to ask. So when you catch yourself marinating in an emotion, do you know the questions to ask yourself to process yourself through it? This will guide you to that. And I will be doing a book signing today at 945 in the bookstore if you're interested in exploring that. But another tool for you, if you want to take this deeper and find out where you are in each of the emotional intelligence competencies, there are assessments that can enable you to do that. And EQ, emotional intelligence, can be raised with effort. But the power of this kind of assessment tool is it shows you where to focus your effort. It shows you where you're already doing really well and where you may have some blind spots. If the person who's perceived to be a bully is someone on your leadership team, the owner of the business, or someone who's not changing their behavior despite your best efforts, 
You, as the HR professional, don't have to take it on all by yourself. That's one of the tools and ahas that uh, I think is so important for us all to recognize. You can use outsource, or out, outside resources that you pull in and you manage, that you facilitate to help raise awareness. So as an executive coach, I often work with individuals and teams over a six-month period of time to dramatically change and augment the culture. So when a team is working together and being coached in these skills, uh, the impact has a positive ripple effect across the whole organization. I'd like to share a few scenarios with you now to have you imagine what you would do if you were faced with this situation. So I have four different scenarios here. And in just a minute, I'm going to ask you to pick one of them to talk about with the person sitting next to you. And so the first one, imagine that a VP leader in your organization has charged you with helping to develop diplomacy skills in one of the directors who reports to her. What might that be a cue to? I need you to develop diplomacy skills. What do you need to check out? Second, members of the former culture are colliding with members from a new culture, and you notice some people are behaving fearfully of the other group. Some people have started saying, I'm being bullied, seemingly to avoid engaging in healthy conflict. Third, a manager just asked you, how do I correct a bully's behavior when it's directed at me? What do I do? And fourth, there's a significant leadership transition going on, and it's clear to you that some of the leaders don't have the same goals. They even have cross goals that are in cross purpose with each other. Conflict is escalating organizationally. Pick one of these that seems relevant to you and uh, chat with one or two people next to you about how you would handle this using the tools that we just talked about today. I could see some very animated conversations going on, and it's clear to me perhaps some of you have dealt with some of these situations. Yes. I wanted to share a few additional resources with you. These are a few of the books that I have written, and several of them are in the bookstore here. But there are some additional resources related to creating a bully-free workplace that are worth uh, looking at as well. So if you want to go deeper into this topic, these are some additional resources that I would suggest to you. Now, I'm getting close to, although I'm not at the end of my presentation, but we're getting close. And I want to circle back to the first tool that I mentioned to you, uh, the tool for combating bullying in the workplace. Anybody remember the very first one I mentioned to you? Imagination, that's right. I'd like you to take a deep breath right now, a couple of really deep breaths. Then I would ask you to close your eyes. And imagine yourself as someone who has been empowered with the awareness and the tools for growing your organization for the better. Imagine that you have what it takes to create a great place to work. See yourself as a part of a team with a common purpose to create more collaborative and innovative cultures in the workplace, to improve people's lives and to make the world a better place. Your mission isn't easy. Yeah, there will be challenges, but you're not alone. You can ask for help from others who are in this with you, the people you were just talking to, for example. They're in this with you. To see how I pictured all of you in my imagination, open your eyes. You have the ability to be superheroes because those of us in this room have the tools, the resources, the know-how, and the collaboration with the people sitting next to us, the mentor network perhaps, or the mastermind team that you form with people who are here at this event. You have uh, opportunities to work through this and to create cultural norms that you instill in your organization. 
I love questions. And I would be delighted to take questions. What questions or comments, suggestions, anything you would like to share? Yes, question. Thank you for the question. I really appreciate this one. So um, there's a couple parts to her question. First is, how are you defining bullying? And then, uh, wow, I, she's done some reading that says that people who are bullying know that they are bullying. Well, there are some instances where people wake up in the morning and say, I want to go get so-and-so. But most of the time, most of the time, we don't wake up in the morning saying, I want to make today a horrible day for so-and-so. Most of us wake up wanting to have a really good day ourselves. But what triggers someone to get engaged in behavior that looks like bullying is unresolved fear and anger. And people do fear and anger differently. So I mentioned to you that uh, VP of IT in a pharmaceutical company that I worked with, he was perceived to be a bully but he had no idea that his behavior was perceived like that. And so we had to start with the understanding of what it takes to build a high-performing team so that we could get to the point where he could then hear the feedback that other people were experiencing him differently than he perceived himself. So um, again, if you're in a situation where somebody is intentionally attacking someone else, we can talk about termination there, right? But the issues that cause most of the organizational challenges are when someone isn't necessarily aware of how their behavior is being perceived. If you've got somebody who's chronically, or if you're chronically, stuck in sadness, anger, or fear, other people are likely experiencing that as bully behavior. Yes, another question. So somebody over here just said congratulations to you. So if, if, in case you didn't hear it, he has 44 different restaurant uh, chain locations. And this stuff experienced in 44 different locations, right? Not uncommon, by the way. And the key is to create a very strong culture. What we do here what the norms are, what the behaviors are, what we don't do here, integrate that into both orientation, integrate that into the existing teams. It's going to require a multi-pronged approach. It's going to require some working with the leaders to get them really on board with how to have the conversations with people to help them recognize when they're being perceived as a bully or when they're crossing lines. And then it's going to create this, or you're going to need to create this culture within the organization where people can give each other feedback. I do another presentation on sparking a feedback revolution. And, you know, it's about how do we give people the tools to give colleagues, peers, coworkers feedback when they're crossing a line. And so, again, that's, those are some resources that you might want to explore. Happy to talk further about that with you. Other questions or comments? Yes, question back there. So I'm certified in 18 different assessments, and I use different assessments for different purposes. When I'm doing executive coaching with somebody, I want to look at five different sciences. So I'm using communication styles, motivators, um, acumen. I'm using... Uh, capacity, skill, emotional intelligence, and I can pull out of those depending on what's needed at the time. Yeah. I would be very, very grateful for your evaluation of this session. I love feedback. So please let me know what you liked. Let me know what you would like me to do more of or less of in the future. Thank you so much for being here today. <laughs>